So we are back here once again. Um, we had an earlier presentation um, at one o'clock yes. in uh, Ventana. Uh, we're here to re-record and hopefully to uh, give you guys a better presentation than we did last time. Uh, we had a lot of technical difficulties. So here we are. Um, my name is Peyton Heeman. Uh, I'm a high school sophomore. I'm Sebastian Sharp. Uh, I'm a high school junior. And my name is Anisha, and I'm a sophomore. And this year we took part in the first international Mars mission design contest. And our submission um, from Team 3 North America West is Polemos 1. So let's, let's take it away. Team North America West presents Polemos 1, a 550-day, 28.5 time mission to Mars, focused on creating a foundation for similar missions and the technology that drives them. Since the planet Mars is named after the Roman god of war, we chose to name our mission Polemos I after the divine personification of war in Greek mythology, Polemos. By the time the mission's two possible launch windows open in 2031 and 2033, the equipment will take we're taking on the mission will have matured and solidified into a support structure and jumping off point for not only our pioneering first five, but for the exploration of Mars as a whole. Just advancing the slide for a sec. Come on guys, bear with me. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, Polymos 1 uh, will land in Milankovitch, a 118-kilometer diameter crater located in Arcadia Planitia. We chose this location because it's one of eight sites in the Martian mid-latitudes identified by uh, a study uh, where ice has been found particularly close to the surface. Finding large amounts of subsurface ice is very important for our mission because uh, we will need it to power uh, some parts of the habitat that you'll hear about later on. And landing in this crater is also a good choice for practical reasons uh, other than the ice. Uh, the crater floor is mostly flat plains, so we expect that astronauts uh, on EVAs and in rovers uh, should be able to traverse it easily, even at high speeds. Additionally, uh, this flat terrain should allow the different elements of the mission to communicate easily with each other, since they should all have line of sight contact. There's a lot of factors to consider when trying to plan for a Mars habitat. You, you have to have life support systems, radiation protection, um, ease of both intravehicular and extravehicular activity. And then you have to look at the cost of everything. We were brainstorming and we were throwing around ideas, maybe Transhab or a dome. But due to their many drawbacks, we ended up going with the custom habitat. Other designs were too heavy, cost intensive, didn't offer enough protection, or wouldn't be ready by the 2030s when um, the design constraints of the contest required that Polemos launch. So we're taking design cues from the NASA Habitat Demonstration Unit and other Mars habitats, habitat designs to keep costs low. Um, we include a, a water tank at the top of the hab, um, which provides equal parts radiation protection and a handy reservoir of drinkable water for our astronauts. In addition, through a pressurized tunnel, the habitat would be connected to a greenhouse. Amenities include a hygiene model, geolab, medical station, maintenance workstation, robotics workstation, airlock, and a separate inflatable crew area. The habitat will come pre-assembled with little setup required, and it'll weigh approximately 16 tons. However, um, sorry. even though NASA hasn't provided an estimated cost of a habitat on Mars, the cost shouldn't be excessively high. 
since similar designs and prototypes have already been researched and developed. And this is also my section. Woohoo! For spacesuits, astronauts on the Palamos 1 mission will use a modified version of the experimental Z series spacesuit developed by NASA. Um, the suit will be made out of a nylon tricot Kevlar and Nomex blend, with the gloves using spandex for extra flexibility. The Kevlar and Nomex will keep the suits durable and sustainable for the whole Mars mission. The spandex on the glove portion of the suit will be needed for flexibility when setting up the HAB, collecting, Mar collecting Mars samples, and driving the pressurized rover. In addition, the helmets will have a thin sheet of gold on them, giving astronauts protection from the sun's UV radiation when they're outside of the HAB or rover. The calculated weight of the spacesuit design is approximately 13.5 kilograms. In addition, the life support system and oxygen needed for an EVA weighs 22.5 kilograms. This comes to a total weight of around 36 kilograms, making maneuvering easy. The suits will have an integrated hatch, what we call a suit port, on their backpacks, allowing the astronauts to seal their suits to a docking port and enter the habitat or pressurized rover. This system prevents the contamination and minimizes the amount of Martian dust crew members are exposed to, since the exterior of the suit and the dust carried on it will never enter a pressurized area. So, uh, the EVA suits you just heard about will be excellent for exploring a small area near the landing site, uh, but during their stay on the surface, we expect that the astronauts will need to explore other areas of the crater, which could be more than 100 kilometers away. Uh, and that isn't exactly walking distance, even if you have a high-tech spacesuit. So, to do so, uh, they will need a pressurized rover like the one on the screen, which is an artist's concept of the rovers for NASA's austere missions to Mars plan. The rover for Palamos 1 will be similar in shape and size, even though the rest of the two missions uh, are very different. To board the rover, astronauts will be able to attach their suit ports to hatches on the rear of the vehicle. Uh, to enter the pressurized cabin. This will be able to house them for, well, it will be able to house two of them for up to three weeks or all five of the astronauts for one week uh, in an emergency. This should leave them more than enough time to travel to the other edge of the crater and back since the rover has, a, has the blisteringly high top speed of 20 kilometers per hour. The range of the rover is really only limited by uh, the endurance of the life support system. Uh, the rover will need to return to the HAB to re refill oxygen tanks and stock up on food and other consumables uh, every three weeks or so. The reason uh, the range is essentially unlimited is because the power source is a scaled up version of NASA's advanced Sterling radioisotope generator. Uh, producing five kilowatts of electricity. Since it produces electricity constantly, uh, the rover won't need to stop to recharge or be refueled. Uh, and unlike a solar powered rover, this one uh, will work during a dust storm. The scientific capabilities of the rover will be pretty limited, uh, just weather sensors, uh, cameras, and a set of ground penetrating radar systems to map subsurface features. Uh, this will help the astronauts find the ice deposits they'll need. But most of the data gathered during the rover expedition will be collected by astronauts in EVA suits uh, using cameras, shovels, and core sampling drills uh, to collect data and samples for analysis back at the HAB. These samples will have to be stored in containers on the outside of the rover so the astronauts won't accidentally contaminate them. I think back to you, Peyton, for red water. Thank you, Sebastian. Massive water mining and fuel production plants, like Mithril, which I'll touch on later, have been discussed as great ways to fuel and feed an equally mammoth Mars colony. However, operations like that are currently too far off and will probably require an entire mission's time to set up. 
For Palamos 1, we will use Honeybee Robotics Red Water, a system with scale models already tried and true in thermal vacuum chambers set in a Mars-like environment. The drill uses a combination of traditional drilling with an auger, coil tubing, or CT drilling, already used for industrial oil drilling on Earth, and a special strategy called the Rodriguez ball for melting ice and cycling it through a heat source. This creates an efficient positive feedback loop that uses minimal energy to collect from a well of ever-growing subsurface ice. It requires no special source of electricity and doesn't even need a heater for the water, since that can be run through a nearby kilopower reactor. The two diagrams here show the steps of well formation and water extraction, as well as the internal components of the drill. So the system of the crude habitat will be pressurized to 101.3 kilopascal or 14.69 PSR. The habitat atmosphere will be 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. Nitrogen can be extracted from Martian atmosphere through a condensation process. The life support system will convert one ton of CO2 per day into oxygen for human respiration. Which, will, which is then supplied back to the crew. The air, cycling, re, re, air recycler system must remove the CO2 and supply 1,700 pounds of new oxygen per day, or a total of 617.3 tons of oxygen per year. The humidity will be kept between 20 to 40 percent, and the temperature kept at around 21 degrees Celsius. Daily, humans use 100 watts of power. So the life support system of a settlement which includes food production will require a prop, a prop, approximately 10,000 to 20,000 watts of average power per human habitat. One person will take 0 0.8 kilograms of oxygen, 1.8 kilograms of food, 2.5 kilograms of water, and will give out 1.14 kilograms of CO2, 0 0.96 kilograms of H2O gas, 1 kilogram of waste, and 2 kilograms of H2O liquid. The CO2 treatment will give out oxygen and methane, and we can reuse the oxygen, and the waste treatment will separate solid waste and liquid waste. Another important question we had to ask ourselves is how are we going to power an, an extraterrestrial habitat and make fuel for the trip home? Uh, we need something, uh, we need a power source that uh, doesn't weigh much, uh, doesn't cost a lot, uh, and uh, produces enough power and is also a simple design. NASA has estimated that an early Mars base will require 20 kilowatt hours of power. Uh, so we had to find a solution that would provide that to our habitat without causing us to come up short uh, in any of these other requirements. We explored uh, three options, uh, including solar panels, kilopower reactors, and RTGs. While solar panels are by far the least complex uh, of these solutions and the power source that tends to come to mind when you think of space probes and uh, Martian landers, uh, we think they're too efficient, uh, too inefficient, sorry, very important verbal typo there, uh, because they only convert about 20% of the admittedly small amount of light they receive into power. To power a base, we'd need uh, fields upon fields of panels, and our astronauts won't have time to set those up. Another technology that's already been tried and tested on the Martian surface is the RTG, or radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which converts heat from a radioactive source like a block of plutonium uh, into power. However, uh, an RTG wouldn't put out the amount of electricity we need to power a HAB, and they're kind of heavy for their power output. But in 2015, kilopower reactors became an option. 
Originally created by NASA for use on the moon and maybe eventually Mars, it's estimated that only two of these uh, will be needed to reach our goal of 20 kilowatt hours. This is achievable before 2030 as well. Uh, at the moment, a single kilopower reactor can be pushed to produce 10 kilowatt hours. The only problem with uh, a reactor of this type is that it requires uh, a very large radiator to dissipate the amount of heat required, uh, but this can be easily rectified uh, by uh, mounting the radiator on top, like you see in these artists' concept images, turning them into a surprisingly radioactive umbrella shape. The two kilopower reactors we plan to use uh, to power the HAB will weigh only 6.61 tons in total, uh, making them an efficient, compact, and surprisingly lightweight energy source for the mission. Now, normally, uh, we change speakers at this point, but looks like this section is also mine. So hope you're enjoying the sound of my voice. Well, MS-1, as you've heard, is meant to build a foundation for future missions to Mars by testing new technologies, uh, but it's also meant to study Martian geology, the history of the Martian climate, and the possibility of life on Mars, past and present. Thanks to their advanced Equipment and diverse skill set, the crew will be able to study these topics in far more detail and with far more accuracy than a robotic mission ever could. But assuming the crew can't use the rover to find a way out of the crater, which isn't in the mission plan, but could happen, uh, they will have roughly 11,000 square kilometers of Martian soil to explore. There's no way they can thoroughly investigate all that land in only a year and a half, so they will instead have to concentrate their exploration on the six areas we've labeled in red in the image on top. They'll spend uh, two to three months looking at each one. The astronauts will begin by exploring the scarps near the HAB using a combination of EVAs and rover trips. The rover's ground penetrating radar will be extensively used during this period to map the ice inside the scarps after water has been found and the red water drilling rig uh, is operational, the astronauts will explore areas of the crater that are further away from the HAB. Uh, for these trips, the rover will be crewed by one scientist and uh, one astronaut uh, capable of repairing the rover in an emergency. Uh, you can see all of this information in uh, the draft schedule in the bottom right. Astronauts on EVAs won't be able to carry many tools, and the rover lacks the space for all of the equipment necessary to analyze the samples they collect, so those will instead be brought back to the HAB. There, uh, the other three astronauts will use spectrometers to study the composition of rock samples uh, and a compact color biofinder and signs of life detector to search them for biosignatures. Additionally, water melted from ice samples from the scarps will be filtered through an agnostic life finder to search for molecules similar to DNA. And another ALF will be attached to the red water drilling rig to filter the water it collects before use. Astronauts should also be able to study the history of the Martian climate by analyzing uh, cores from the ice in the scarps for trapped gases like scientists do in Antarctica today. As you can see on the schedule, the last month of the mission will be dedicated to sorting through the samples that will be collected and choosing which ones to take back to Earth. Since we were only told that there would be a Mars Ascent vehicle uh, available for our crew, we didn't know how much space uh, there would be to bring back Mars rocks, but we assumed there would be some. Polymus-1 is likely to collect far more samples than the MAV can take back, so the astronauts will have to choose only the most interesting specimens uh, to return to laboratories on Earth. But they'll be able to leave the rest in containers inside or outside of the HAB in case a future mission chooses to come to collect them. Now I'm going to hand it over to Anish. Every astronaut will wear two bracelets at all times, a personal active dazzle mirror 
a physical fitness monitor similar in size to a smartwatch. First, the Palmas Personal Active Dosimeter or PPAD is a smaller second generation version of the European Clear Personal Active Dosimeter installed on the ISS in 2016. And both will measure the amount of radiation the astronauts are exposed to throughout the mission and provide the astronauts with real time data about their exposure. The physical fitness monitor will track the heart rate, blood pressure, and quality of sleep of every astronauts. In addition to the exposure, the astronauts are more likely to lose muscle mass, especially their anti gravity muscles, like the quadra quadriceps back muscles during their stay on Mars, which will be measured by a bioelectrical impedance analysis system. Since this simple and quick process, BIA testing will be performed about every three weeks. This regular testing will mean that all astronauts can be tested at the same time. Every two crew members return to the habitat from an rover expedition. Given doctor's data of for all the astronauts at the same time. Woohoo, I get to speak again. Um, one of the technologies Polymos One will be bringing along to Mars is a spider-like rover named Olala, after the Greek spirit of the war cry. Weighing half a kilogram, she is a scaled-down version of the athlete system that would be used for mithril, an ice harvesting and in-situ propellant production plant on a much larger scale than the red water uh, system the Palamos program will use. Alala's larger siblings, just like her, will use two software suites to drive both autonomous and driver-in-the-loop functions. To develop a manual of real-life fixes and possible failure modes, Alala will be brought along on the pressurized rover while astronauts are on scientific expeditions, and an astronaut will be able to test her maneuverability and decision-making skills. In the top right, JPL Principal Investigator Brian Wilcox stands in front of the existing one-fourth scale athlete model. Wilcox has written a paper on athlete and its systems. Created for the moon, Mithril and Palemos will take it to Mars. In the bottom left is a render by the Mithril team at the University of Illinois, showing a full-scale athlete behind a kilopower reactor and next to two propellant storage domes and an ice mining drill that it will assemble as part of Mithril's deployment. Mithril is designed to be landed in one go in the late 2030s, and they hope to send it on a single Starship or SLS launch. Just to be clear, Mithril is a concept mission, um, but we did think it was so cool that we had to include some of its technologies. The agricultural system we chose for Palmos One, Palmos One mission is hydroponic, as it is an efficient and relatively under-demanding option for Martian astronauts. The system utilizes water source from Martian ice, as well as micronutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to create a nutrition solution that produces a wide variety of traditional produce. This allows Martian astronauts to avoid reliance on soil for the plant's nutrition, which is not the most efficient or beneficial option, as hydroponics reduces plants 50% faster and converts 10 times the amount of water. Due to the hydroponics being located indoors to protect against radiation, botanical grow lights will be utilized as plant energy source. The hydroponic grow lights will be uh, produce a magenta light frequency as it combines benefits of both red and blue light. Red light has been shown to, ben to be beneficial in producing taller and leafier plants, while the blue light promotes leaf expansion, sprouting, and root development, which are all important factors in the quality and efficiency of plant growth. An additional benefit of the hydroponic system is that it requires minimal maintenance 
especially when compared to other options such as aeroponics and traditional farming methods. Maintenance includes draining and refilling the hydroponic nutrition solution about twice a month, as well as simple cleaning measures to ensure the system stays in proper condition. The image to the right depicts an active indoor hydroponic system similar to the one being used in almost one mission. I hope you all enjoy being blinded by the only white slide on the presentation. <laughs> In the spirit of international cooperation, the crew of five will be selected from NASA, JAXA, ESA, and either CN and CNSA and CARI. Each astronaut will be cross-trained in a variety of subjects. At least two people will be trained in each aspect of the mission, and there'll be one person, there'll be one person designated commander. This commander will have the final say on important decisions in order to avoid conflict. And if a verbal or physical conflict does crop up, they are responsible for breaking it up. Since you can't send, since you can't just send someone back to Earth, confinement to quarters would be the highest possible punishment. Because we don't know exactly who our crew will be and what skills they may already have, we chose to leave ambiguous who exactly would do what. Training would be smoother and less heavy if astronauts settled into their existing specialties and trained outside of those, rather than being shoehorned into a designated position. If the Palamas program were to exist, that decision would have to be made shortly after crew selection. Uh, these are our general statistics, and thank you for all your attention. If you have any questions, you can let us know. Well, I see that you addressed the challenges and you rose to the to the challenge. My question is, was it fun? Was it fun? Yeah, I say it's fun. The great part about um, having to undertake this as a team and actually having to like get to know each other, create a Discord server together, um, talk to each other in those calls. Um, was that we actually became like good friends in the process of um, going through, um, in the process of like writing the paper, doing the research, doing the presentation, um, going insane, trying to edit this last night. Um, we were in right to the limit, it was crazy. Um, but being able to do that together took the edge off of all the panic. Yeah, this was actually fun because we learned we learn how to do team, how to utilize teamwork. And these are all new informations. And this is like basically the learning curve and to learn how to, it's, it's like a learning a skill of teamwork so that in future we can use this and work with other people. I feel like you guys already covered the teamwork aspect, which was awesome. Uh, so I'm just going to stick with, I had a ton of fun. I'm really glad I did this. Thank you.